All right, so this is going to be a design and building video about a little bit more in depth than usual about the Nighthawk, which is a rubber powered endurance model airplane, meaning designed to fly for as long as possible, not based on a plan of any real plane. And I designed this for the embryo endurance category for Flying Aces Club competition. Here's a couple pictures of its first day out in Wawayanda, New York, Great Flying Field in October 2020. A couple building materials to start in these first couple slides. The main materials for building planes, I would say the two most important are balsa wood and tissue paper, hence the stick and tissue name of these planes. The size that I use for these kind of small sub 20 inch wingspan airplanes most commonly is 1 16th of an inch balsa wood over here. Comes in a 1 16th by 3 by 36 sheet. You can get on some great suppliers online or at a lot of art stores. Thin plywood is good to have as well for a number of applications. Music wire is good to have for propeller shafts, landing gear, that kind of thing. 031, 047 are the most common diameters. Um, aluminum and brass tubing are also very useful for motor pegs, bushing propellers, tissue paper, of course. Standard tissue paper from a hobby store, Hallmark, that kind of thing will do the job. Better kind of Japanese style tissue paper is also available online. Lighter weight, stronger when it's wet and shiny on one side. Couple nose bushings, good to use around the nose block of the airplane, fuel tubing kind of random accessories and acetate or some kind of clear plastic that you can use for windshields. Propellers, you can get standard injection molded plastic. These ones are pretty excellent and there's a couple options. These are just kind of the shaft materials I was talking about before. Good to have a needlepoint file for deburring these tubes when you do use them to push the propellers. Balsa blanks, almost fully carved, are available from Volari products. Those are also great and can allow for higher pitch propellers. And also carving propellers from scratch is sort of the next step. You can build a block with a given pitch and diameter, carve it, and get a light propeller with the dimensions you want. Um, Josh Finn over on YouTube has some great videos on this. I might do a little bit more detail on propeller carving in a future video as well. Tools and supplies, range of glues, a workboard is probably the most important thing. This one is a balsa wood workboard that Gillows used to sell. Some people use ceiling tile or even a sheet of metal with magnets. Kind of whatever works if you like to have pins just something that's soft enough to stick the pins into to hold your structure down cutting board cutting tools pliers for the wire tweezers are always good to have wax paper for putting over your plan and sanding block i use 320 grit on one side 240 grit on the other and that's good for most of my applications when building structures fai rubber is the best stuff to use for these rubber bands tan super sport uh, i keep a couple boxes i think 330 seconds one eighth width Lubricated with some sort of silicone based grease. Dow Corning 33 is one of the best and some kind of geared winder if you want to be stretch winding your planes. This one is a 10 to 1 ratio K and P winder. Here are the rules for embryo endurance. If you're interested, you can pause here, look over it. Basically, a slightly scale looking plane, usually in the 16 to 20 inch wingspan range. A couple design inspirations for the Nighthawk came almost all from other embryo models I've built before. One of the categories I've built the most planes of, here's George Bredehoft's Big Cat, originally designed by Al Backstrom. Really nice and simple with these straight lines, which inspired the fuselage shape of the Nighthawk. And this plane is really an excellent flyer. Pretty much right off the board, has had an amazing climb for all three or so that I've built. This one is Herb Cothy's design Go Devil, which I've built, inspired by the one that Tom Hallman built over on YouTube as well. Um, if it's kept light, this plane flies extremely well, sort of styled like the old 1930s and 40s Wakefields. This plane also has under camber, which inspired me to try it on the Nighthawk. I got very good flight performance with this, and with the clean airframe of an embryo, the extra drag with an undercambered airfoil does not seem to be too much of a penalty. Josh Finn's Max Out and Stephen Wrigley's derivative Maverick embryo were big inspirations for the Nighthawk in terms of proportions and moments. I sort of took the average of these four models to determine how long I wanted my nose and tail to be and wing aspect ratio, that's wingspan divided by average cord or thickness. The nice thing about these two models that was really, I think, pioneered by the max out and maybe the debut embryo as well, is just how long the fuselage is for the wing shape. It looks very big, um, but it really allows for a lot of rubber to go in there. The models are clean enough that they still have a good glide and flight performance, and you can just have a much longer motor run than you would with sort of a more traditional smaller embryo like the Big Cat or something like that. These models can approach flights of up to one and a half, two minutes with the propeller running the whole time before the glide even starts. 
which is a really good thing for duration, especially in varying conditions of wind, humidity, that kind of thing. Here's the current state of two of my embryo planes. Obviously have seen, have seen some battle and needed a replacement. That was part of why I decided to build a Nighthawk, needed something new. Here's a couple initial concept sketches. As you can see, I was originally thinking of going with a biplane, which I scrapped, but I did keep the basic fuselage shape, swept back wing and tail, long tail moment, and relatively large horizontal stabilizer. I was also thinking of going with sort of a geodetic truss wing structure, which I didn't do for this plane for the sake of simplicity. If I were to have parallel leading and trailing edges in another iteration of this model, I would definitely put in crisscrossing ribs for rigidity, but it was too much of a pain to try to measure and cut all of those for one of the first models I was really designing. So here's sort of my initial draft of plans. I drew on a software called QCAD. The free trial is very basic, kind of old fashioned, but does what I need it to for drawing these plans. And most importantly, doesn't have any kind of time limit, so you can use it indefinitely as long as you're okay with missing out on a few of the more advanced features. Here I'm just showing my nose and tail moments from the front and back of the plane to the center of mass here as I determined. This was determined from the tail moment arm, which is defined as the distance from the leading edge of the wing to the leading edge of the horizontal tail. And this is used in the center of gravity calculation right here from William McCombs's um, Making Scale Models Fly book, which has some, some really great formulas. I use the CG formula as well as one for vertical tail size. And I should just say here that the embryo rules limit horizontal tail area to 50% of the wing. So because I wanted a large tail volume, large nose and tail moments, I basically blew up my stab all the way up to that 50%. So my wing is at, 20, at 50 square inches of area. My stabilizer on this model is right at 25. And I calculated my tail volume with here and my center of gravity from that tail volume and got a CG, I believe, at 94% back of the wing cord here. So that's 94% back from the front. Pretty standard for these embryos with big tail volume. You get them balancing really close to the back of the wing, which is much, much farther back than kind of the standard 30 to 40% for most scale models that this, that this formula kind of spits out. One other consideration I put in for the fuselage is keeping the nose at least an inch wide, both in height and width. This might cause a little bit of extra drag, but most importantly, what it really does is it keeps the rubber motor from interfering with the actual structure. If you get a really narrow nose, like on some models, especially some older models or scale models that need the rubber to be close to the structure, you can really run into problems with too much rubber being wound up and bunching up, and it, cause, it can cause the motor to hang up, it can damage the structure. Um, basically, things that either damage the plane or limit flight time or both. And with this relatively wide nose, I have not had any of those problems so far. Uh, knock on balsa wood. Airfoil inspirations came from George Perryman's little Nordic glider. George Perryman right here designed these amazing great speckled bird planes, which I would love to build at some point. I believe this airfoil was ripped from a Hungarian free flight flyer, George Benedek. I basically just traced this cross section, put in the spars, leading edge and trailing edge that I wanted, and put credit on the plan where it's due. And seemed to work out pretty well. You know, it's not, not too aggressive an undercamber. That spar forward of 50% on the top of the wing might give some sort of turbulator effect. And the narrow, maybe 8%, eight, 7% flat bottomed airfoil on the stabilizer causes some extra lift in the back, which allows for the center of gravity to be even further back. This plane also has a dethermalizer system, which I'll probably explain in a separate video. It is basically a viscous timer on the fuselage right here can't see, it's blurred by the wing, but it's connected to the spring. You time how long it takes the arm of that timer to run around with the spring pulling on it, and time that before, and then fly the plane with the spring pre-wound to a set time of two minutes or so, if that's the maximum flight time you want. After those two minutes, the spring disengages from the timer. This line goes slack, and the wing flips up, bringing the plane out of the sky. The reason this is important is because light models like these embryos that glide well are at a really high chance of flying away in a thermal in a rising air current. If you fly one of these for long enough, especially on a warm day, one time it's going to glide and it's just going to fly away. So these dethermalizers are essential to have, and especially with a model as, as uh, competitive or as good in duration as an embryo, it's important to have something like a pop-up wing when you have a light wing loading like this, not just a pop-up tail as some kind of heavier old time or scale models might have. The pop-up tail does work, but sometimes when you pop up the trailing edge of the stab, especially in a light model, if the pulling force isn't strong enough, it can get pushed back down in the glide, or the plane can just continue to rise. 
because it's able to keep flying on that wing with the stabilizer at an extreme negative incidence. All right, well, that's about it for the design. Thanks for watching through this part and enjoy the slideshow and flights. That's Oliver's new embryo. It's unnamed. And boy, it's getting way the heck up there. He has a DT, so let's hope it uh, works for him. Okay, it's on its way down. Beautiful flyer. Very little dihedral. Okay, I think he's got his max. It's a half mile from where I am to that tree line, so let's hope he doesn't... Oh good, he's in front of it. Wow, that's close. Oh my gosh, on the field. Excellent. Wow.